Welcome to Primal Edge Health. Cutting edge holistic lifestyle optimization with a focus on nutrition, environment, light, movement, and worldview. Exploring animal-based nutrition, whole unrefined ancestral foods, regenerative agriculture, homesteading, and a holistic lifestyle approach for health, vitality, and optimal performance so we can thrive and bring others along for the ride. Building healthy bodies, homes, families, and communities. Because we are far more than what we eat. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Ancestral Supplements. Putting back in what the modern world has left out. Ancestral Supplements brings you nose-to-tail organ meats like liver, kidney, pancreas, brain, marrow, heart, thymus, thyroid, and more in simple, convenient gel and capsules. Order yours today at ancestralsupplements.com. Now let's get into the meat of this episode of Primal Edge Health. I'm here with Matthew Engelhar of Cafe Gratitude, Gracias Madras, and Be Love Farm. Matthew is a, uh, a farmer, and he runs a what seems like a kind of a farm-to-table operation. Am, am I right when I say that? A farm-to-table restaurant? Um, it's Be Love Farm is a experiment in regenerative agriculture, and we supply our restaurant, Gracias Madre, with produce. We also have a farm stand. We feed the community, and we feed a few other uh, people in the surrounding Vacaville area. So we're not a restaurant on the farm though we do serve a lot of food here a lot we do lots of retreats and corporate events and stuff like that nice nice yeah so we're really big on regenerative agriculture here we're kind of you know we're working on our own little homestead so i've got i'm sure i've got a thousand questions i could ask you uh but yeah i'd love to start out with talking about your experience with uh the famous restaurant cafe gratitude because this is a place that i used to uh to go to back in 2009 and 2010 i used to get the that ice cream that you guys made you guys made like a uh, a non-dairy ice cream that was uh it was good. It was pretty expensive. It was like cashews or something in it, I think. Cashews or almonds. And uh, yeah, that stuff was tasty. And um, yeah, how did you get started with Cafe Gratitude? And how did that project come about? Well, I think it's really important to remember that Cafe Gratitude started mostly as, initially, as an experiment in um, an experiment in sacred commerce, how to have love be in the workplace and the plant-based element of it kind of just came along um, after that. Mm -hmm. So uh, when my wife and I got together, our children were grown up. We said, what do we want to do with our life? And we decided, what if we just listened to our internal guidance and followed that regardless, just what would that be like? What would that life be like? Not, Not given by circumstances, just by inner guidance. And um, the, one of the first guidances we got was to design a board game about that trained people in uh, shifting from their human habit of scarcity, not enough time, not enough money, not enough love, not enough beauty, not enough, not enough, not enough, to all the abundance that we actually live in and noticing that and what would happen if we really really started noticing how provided for we are. Uh, And then we developed that board game and decided, well, what are we going to do with this board game? And we said, well, why don't we order, why don't we open a cafe? I liked coffee. My my wife was a baker. And the plant-based thing just came after we we had already decided to open a restaurant. Oh, we tried raw food for raw plant-based diet for 40 days and felt really good and decided, oh, let's just open a raw plant food, plant-based restaurant. And that's how it kind of started. Very yeah. innocently, no business, no business plan, nada. Just that's cool. Innocent. Yeah, you know it's it's funny because that I mean at that time it was a really popular thing, right? The raw vegan diet was uh, was kind of trending, and um, you know in the, in the mid two thousands, a lot of people were getting interested in it. And uh, yeah, so you did forty days on like a raw plant based diet, and uh, what did you notice? How did you feel? Oh, we felt very, very clear, very energized. Yeah, just kind of 
sharp, energized, clean, clear. Yeah, like that. Yeah, the restaurant did really well, right? I mean, you guys opened a bunch of locations around the Bay Area. I know you had, you were in, when I first heard of you, you guys were in like Marin, San Francisco, Oakland. There were several locations in the Bay Area that I had. Yeah. I think there were eight in the Bay Area. Yeah, that yeah it's quite a bit. You guys grew pretty quickly as well. Yeah. What do you yeah, think it was? Do you think it was kind of like a cultural, it was, you know, right in line with like the cultural zeitgeist or was it, uh, did you have big investors or how did, how did it grow so quickly? No, it grew quickly because of the space we created, because at the same time there were other plant-based restaurants that, that in the Bay Area, like Urban Forage and there were a few others. But, you know, for us, it wasn't about the food. It was a social experiment. Yeah. Mostly. And so, you know, at the waiters... The server's asking what you're grateful for. A bell used to ring and we'd give something away. It was the, the employees, we, we, said, we used to say, train our employees in unconditional love and turn them loose in a retail environment. So that was the social experiment and people, people dug it, you know, in yeah. San Francisco, it was a hit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and guys, the, food, the food was great. I'm not saying the food wasn't great, but it, wasn't it was so much about. It. Oh, the yeah. food was good, man. I mean, it's like as far as uh, plant-based cuisine at the time, that was one of the better restaurants that I had visited. You know, there are a lot of little, uh, f like I don't know, vegan fast food restaurants in Santa Cruz, like Saturn Cafe and stuff like that. And there's the food. I never really liked a lot of the food, but what you guys did was something. Delicious. You guys made all those raw vegan desserts, and those were those were kind of. I would go and I would just have several of those desserts. I remember, and uh, yeah, it was it was a good bridge, right, to get people interested in it. So, um, yeah, and that what what year was it that you opened up the restaurants? Oh four. Wow. So by two thousand nine, you already had eight locations or nine locations. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So, uh, what what ended up shifting? Because I know that you personally, you were doing a a plant based diet for a while. You guys, uh, Cafe Gratitude was known as the vegan restaurant. It became known as a vegan restaurant. You did some cooked food, uh, a lot of raw food stuff, and it got a lot of people interested in the raw food thing because they had the gourmet uh, raw desserts and stuff like that. They're really tasty. Um, and I know that eventually within. A few years of that, you you had like a personal dietary shift and and kind of shifted in your perspective on how you wanted to, uh, I guess, eat and uh, and live your life. Um, when was that, and how did that come about? Well, I think let's see, nineteen about two thousand and eight, we moved out to Be Love Farm, mm -hmm. and we were still eating plant based, but um, in stewarding a piece of land and watching how energy flows in a system. Uh, we noticed that, you know, natural, natural, <laughs> sorry about the dog. <laughs> we, we noticed how, uh, energy moved in the system and we, we were there trying to restore fertility and we saw that ruminants, grass eaters, especially, but also chickens, ducks were, uh, really essential for stewarding a piece of land and maintaining fertility. So, uh, slowly over time, as we started farming, we just saw, wow, natural farming without animals isn't very natural because nature without animals isn't actually very natural. There is no nature without animals. So that's how we slowly uh, moved in that direction. And I, but I will say that, um, and I, I always say this, that a, a plant-based diet is a great choice in terms of uh, the environment and ecological impact if you don't have access to uh, uh, animal products that are stewarded in the proper way on a you know, piece of land. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because most people when they do a plant-based diet now they're going for processed, refined stuff like Beyond Burgers made out of canola and uh, you know genetically modified yeah. fake hemoglobin from GMO soy, right? So it's it, I mean, there's so many different types of, of plant-based diets out there, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you were so you were more about the idea. The Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, so it sounds like you're more. Uh, you're really into regenerative agricultural models, where we're actually putting energy back into the soil, helping to amend the soil. Yeah. And yeah. 
Yeah, grass eating animals are, see, what animals do is they allow us to keep the earth covered and still harvest the solar energy. Every time we till, it's a, a, it's a degenerative process. Every time we, we turn over the soil, we say the mother is modest, she likes to keep herself covered, but annual agriculture, which is all of our, most of our agriculture, it's, it's soy, corn, all the annuals, something, plow and plant, plow and plant, plow and yeah. plant. That's always a degenerative process. So yeah. animals allow us to keep that soil food web alive and going because we keep things in pasture, keep things covered, keep a living plant on the soil at all times. So yeah. uh, there's a lot to it, but animals are our allies. That they, they, eat, they eat perennial grasses and we can extract something from them. So it's, they're really our allies. Yeah, yeah. So you were trying to do agriculture, organic agriculture, without animals when you first started, right? Yeah, yeah, we were. And, and of course, it's possible, but it requires a lot of inputs. And usually those inputs come from an animal system. What people don't realize is most of the vegetables at Whole Foods or wherever you buy them are fertilized from the industrial holocaust animal system there is blood meal bone meal manure from the feedlots is fertilizing most of those vegetables so it's not like if you're a plant-based person you're getting away from that unless mm -hmm. you're you're going to very buying all your food from very specific farms it, everyone everyone is tapped into that system because people are buying inputs from that system isn't that, so, that's an interesting, it's almost a shocking thing to learn, right? I mean, you start trying to do a plant-based diet, you think you're doing something good for the environment, good, you know, holistically, and then you realize, wait a minute, I mean, these, this organic agriculture, even if you're eating organic, right, this organic agriculture requires animal input, uh, whether that be from manure or from worms, right, vermiculture, or from uh, the microbes in the soil. I mean, these are other living organisms that are not plant-based, and we've got all these ecosystems interacting with each other, um, it's interesting. I think a lot of people, a lot of vegans, when they are vegans and vegetarians who may be emotionally attached to the idea, once they get into tr starting to produce their own food, they quickly realize kind of what you realized, and that's uh, that animal input is, is absolutely crucial if you want to do it sustainably, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I won't be extreme. Of course, there's a way you can, you can grow your food from plant-based compost, absolutely. But... Um, it's not going to be quite as, as holistic as nutrition. There's so, animals provide something. Grass eating animals are like the probiotic of the soil. Mm. A cow is essentially a walking, uh, beer vat of microbes. And every time it poops, it gives the soil a probiotic mm -hmm. and you're not going to get that kind of like life giving force from purely vegetable-based compost. Now, if you so, were going to do vegetable-based compost in your situation, like when you first started out, you were running restaurants. Yeah. So were you getting compost from the restaurants, bringing them back to the farm? What was the input? Yeah. What was the system I like? I was buying compost from the San, the, where all the, all the San Francisco compost was ending up, uh, which, again, had scraps from Chinese restaurants and all the restaurants <laughs> in San Francisco. Yeah. It had bones in it. It had all kinds of things in it. Yeah. But yeah, I was getting a set. I was getting the compost from the compost of greenways and restaurant scraps and of from San Francisco. Yeah. So then you'd have to, you know, go retrieve that and bring it back to the farm. I guess that that requires transportation, requires energy, time. Yeah. Yep. Did they but, sell? Would they sell it to you, or do, or would you? Uh, would they give it to you? If you're a county employee, a uh, county, sorry, county. If you live in the county, you can get one truck, pickup truck a day free, but I always got it delivered because I needed a lot more than that. Yeah. So it takes a lot of input, like a lot of the plant input but, to But compost. also when you're, when, you're, when you're plowing to grow those annuals, which are those, t you're, you're always, the soil is always getting degraded. Mm. Uh, if you can keep grass on the soil or soil covered trees for, you can sequester carbon. You can never pull down and sequester carbon if you're tilling all the time. So now we've developed a method of, of growing our vegetables 
no-till vegetables. We haven't developed it. Somebody else has developed it. We're copying it. Yeah. But now all our vegetables are grown in a no-till system. That's so really the, cool. The, the, the key, the key is minimal disturbance, mm -hmm. um, and you know animals also really, really help in that system. So yeah, and all right. So when you started, when you decided, uh, we're going to bring some animals in. We're going to use uh, was it chickens or cows that you brought in first? Uh, chickens first, then cows. Yeah. Was that a hard decision to make? I mean, being you know, I mean, Cafe Gratitude. You had a lot of. Uh, uh, people who consider themselves like you know ethical vegans and uh, very uh, ideologically attached to the idea of you know strictly plant based. Uh, was there like an inner conflict at all with um, with bringing in animals with you, like with your own views? Well, making the sacrifice. I mean, taking the life of an animal is always intense. I don't want to ever diminish that. That's an yeah. intense experience, and it should be. <laughs> you take it's a big responsibility. But I didn't think. I mean, we had been very public about our transformation. My wife does a newsletter and she does Instagram and all that stuff. So we were talking about our inner process all the way through. Yes. But, and it was that maybe six months or a year after we had made the first sacrifice that someone, that, you know, someone got onto it and decided to make it, be upset about it. Yeah. But for us, our process was very public and out there. And um, we didn't know we were, considered like icons of the plant-based world we mm -hmm. just we did our gratitude thing we weren't we weren't pushing we never pushed but we never promoted veganism we promoted gratitude that was our thing yeah, yeah. and we were a plant-based restaurant so it was a surprise that people got so reactive like why did it why did they care what i eat you know yeah yeah i mean it's it, it does seem kind of interesting right because you're coming at it you're looking at it holistically right you're trying to do everything as holistically as you can um trying to like you said amend the soil trying to do everything um as beneficially for the environment as you could so you didn't really think that this would become an issue but it seems like there was at some point soon after you uh you know started using more animals and talking a little bit about what you guys were doing on the farm it seems like there was some backlash, right? Like some pretty intense yep. backlash, if I remember the news reports. We call it Slaughtergate. Slaughtergate. Oh, goodness. <laughs> what year was that? Uh, you know, I have no idea. Probably about 14 or something, 2014 or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then what, what, how did you first hear about it? Did you first hear about this through social media stuff? Or how did you? I think it was social media. Because you're just on your farm. You're just you know, day to day yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, we've so moved on. You know, it's, I, I don't really like to dredge it up because it's kind yeah. of, to me, it's kind of old news. It's like, you know, every, each to their own. Yeah. And uh, it's great. I'm, I'm all, you know, my, my daughter also has three plant based restaurants in Los Angeles and she, she is a vegan. And, yeah. you know, she, get, she gets it. She gets all of it. And she's, great I'm, I'm cheering her on nice nice so but you had some backlash though i mean what what was the backlash like if we just briefly talk about kind of what went down with that i mean i know i i heard that there was some like death threats i mean maybe um you know a, a little bit of uh yeah there, i mean there was a lot of upset and it kind of there were a few protests and phone calls and it's okay. It, it it moved on. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's a people can get very fanatical and attached to their views, yeah. and um, I understand. We all have things we're passionate about. Yeah. And I'm glad people are passionate about things. And uh, I was always a little surprised why they care what cared what we ate. Yeah. Yeah. So that when they protested, did they actually come to the restaurants, or was it at your farm? Yeah, they came to the restaurant. Okay. Picketed and yelled or screamed and then left or how did that go? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> like yeah. yeah, it's funny. You guys seem like such non-confrontational people. You don't even like talking about it. It's just in the past. We're doing what we're doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on, right on. Well, that's good. That's good that it didn't last too long. It seems like these things do tend to blow over. And um, you know, I mean, you got a highly successful restaurant business. You still do. And. Um, yeah, that's cool, man. So, so as far as uh, the 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 farm goes now, you've been doing this for uh, what, almost ten years now. You've been farming uh, fourteen yeah. years. O over ten years, yeah. 
Wow, it was over a decade of farming, and, and uh, you didn't grow up as farmers, did you? No, a lot of trial and error. Yeah. So the fir- I guess the first uh, trial and error was kind of um, trying to do all plant input, then you brought in the animals. How, how different was it, and how much of a difference did you see when you brought in chickens and then ultimately ruminant animals? Um, I think we, I mean, we saw a big difference and the biggest difference is adding that with no tilling Mm -hmm. is the biggest difference, the most destructive thing. People, people don't really realize that the plow is much more, kills way more people than the plow, than the sword or the gun. The plow is the most destructive thing on the planet. It's changed the planet way more than at the atom bomb, the, wow. you know, the, for t- the, the fertile crescent where agriculture started is that area from Iraq to Syria. Seen anything fertile about that area, re- fertile about that re- area recently? Absolutely no, not. No, it's destroyed through mismanagement. Libya used to be the grain bowl of the Roman Empire. Wow. Now it's, it's nothing. It's completely destroyed. So... I think what people have to understand is that agriculture is the most impactful industry we do on the planet, much more than oil and gas. It's changed the face of the planet more. It's destroyed, it's destroyed more. And how we do our agriculture is the most important thing going forward. And I, I want to encourage every, all your listeners to uh, watch a movie called Kiss the Ground that is hopefully going to be on Netflix very soon. My son produced all about the opportunity of regenerative agriculture and um, climate change, that plants actually can draw the carbon, do draw the carbon. Anywhere you see a green plant, carbon is being drawn out of the atmosphere and sequestered in the soil. And if it's done properly and coordinated and so forth, uh, it can have a huge impact on uh, cooling the planet. We can cool the planet. Where do ruminant animals fit into this? You know, as far as you mentioned, sequestering carbon, uh, you know, trapping, well, uh, you know, maintaining the soil. How how do the uh, how do these ruminant animals actually fit into this? And how do you use them on your farm to uh, to sequester carbon and to amend the soil? Well, all the great agricultural soils of the world are, were were formed through the with the cooperation of grassland, grass, and ruminants. In, you know, pre-agriculture was buffalo or wildebeest or big herds of big herds of grass-eating animals built all the great soils of the world, and um, so it's really important that we have really vital grasslands. And uh, what we have, what uh, ruminants are actually our best tool for not only restoring grasslands and using their carbon sink because all the all those black soils uh, like in Iowa and Indiana, that's all carbon there. That's all deep, rich organic matter. That was sequestered there through the cooperation of ruminants and perennial grasses. So ruminants allow us to keep the ground covered, to continue sequestering carbon, and to harvest solar energy from that system through the bodies of those animals. Chickens are the, chickens are the same way. They were always... Mm-hmm flocks of birds following the great herds that were spreading out their manure, eating that they're eating the insects that lived in that manure and uh, sterilizing that pasture and spreading that fertility out so that the next time the cows came or the buffalo came around the cows that um, that fertility had been distributed. So yeah, they're very important. How we use them at the farm is we're, we're always rotate. We move our cows every two or three days. There's about 20 different paddocks, and so the grass uh, and the, the small paddocks mock the, the presence of predators. So there's one more factor. We've got perennial grasses, we've got uh, uh, ruminants, and then we, we, predators were always in that original system. Now, we don't manage predators, but through mobile electric fences, we can keep the cows uh, mobbed in close. They're yeah. stepping in their manure, they're stepping in their poo, they're... they're grazing everything and then moving the next day like predators were driving them so that that grass can fully recover and that part carbon pump can can work here's let me just explain the carbon pump of perennial grass the grass grows 
the ruminant shears it off. That, that crown of grass goes, oh my God, I just lost my solar collectors. So it does two things. It sloughs off part of its roots. It says, I got to downsize. So it sloughs off its roots and it flushes the soil with that carbon uh, slurry that it's made in its leaves to, to get the microbes active so it can grow again. Wow. And then the ruminant come back 50, 60, a year later, days later, whatever, shear it off again. And that is the carbon pump that, that, that just feeds that system. And it's the system, that grass system is, is the, what creates the fertility on the entire planet. And we've replaced that system mostly with corn and soybeans, which is a terrible system. That yeah. system requires tillage every year. It requires high inputs. Yeah. Uh, Pesticides. All right. this creates pollution of the groundwater, pollution yeah. of the Gulf of Mexico, huge degeneration of the soil, and makes crappy animal, not crappy animal feed, but animal feed that really shouldn't be go to animals. So. Yeah. It's all about keeping the keeping the ground covered in grasses to keep the earth cool and fertile. That's and beautifully said. Access, and how we access that that the, the the what that system produces is through the bodies of the animal, through the bodies of ruminants, grass eaters. Wow! Yeah, yeah. You you explain that so elegantly. <laughs> So we're big proponents of eating nose to tail. Whether you're on a ketogenic diet or a carnivorous diet or a diet that focuses heavily on animal foods but still includes some carbohydrates for performance, we are big proponents of eating nose to tail using the whole animal. And that's why we included an entire section on how to prepare nutrient-dense organs nose to tail in the Carnivore Cookbook. Zero carb recipes for people who really love animals which you can find at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. Ancestral Supplements brings you nose-to-tail organ meats like liver, kidney, pancreas, brain, marrow, heart, thymus, thyroid, and more in simple, convenient gel and capsules. We know that a lot of people are trying to include more organs in the diet. A lot of people are trying to focus on the deep nutritional benefits that we get from eating nose to tail, and it can be a little bit overwhelming when you're first starting out. If you're unable to source these things, if you travel a lot and want something that you can bring with you to make sure that you're covering all your nutritional needs on the road, Ancestral Supplements offers liver, kidney, pancreas, brain, bone marrow, and more in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. We often recommend Ancestral Supplements to our clients in the Keto and Carnivore Collective, our monthly community coaching course to help you dial in your diet and lifestyle so that you can live optimally. They're called Ancestral Supplements, but these are really whole, unrefined foods. Dried grass-fed, grass-finished beef organs in convenient gelatin capsules for you and your family. All right, so you've got the paddocks for the cows. You're using mob yep. grazing, mob grazing kind of similar to, uh, you know, Alan Savory and his work, how he recommends. The same, same. Okay, and then after the cows come through the paddock, how soon after do you bring in the chickens? About a week. Okay. About the time the maggots start hatching. And the chickens love those maggots. Yeah. And they make a lot of good eggs with them, right? Yeah. So you get like a nice deep orange yolk when they eat those maggots, huh? Very. Well, chickens can get about 50% of their diet from the environment if they're truly free range and they're living really outdoors, like yeah. really outdoors. Um, ducks, on the other hand, are even better. They can get about 70% of their ah. uh, diet from the environment. So ducks are the best... Ducks are collecting little bits of solar energy, little slugs, little clovers, little snails, little seeds. 12 hours a day, they're on the job and turning that into egg protein in 24 hours. Do you need a so, lot of uh, water for ducks? Because, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm always selfishly you're trying to harvest information when I talk to guests like yourself who are knowledgeable. I've got a pretty – we live on a hillside. 
pretty washed out. Um, we've, we've got to get some electric paddocks up there that we can move and get some mobile paddocks going because it's uh, I mean, we're working with about 15 acres and it's only in four paddocks right now. So it's not been properly managed in the past. Um, and there's not a lot of water up there, right? There's no lakes. There's no ponds. How much water do you need for ducks? They just need enough water, like fresh water, to clear their nostrils. Mm -hmm. So if you had, like, let's say for 20 ducks, if you had a tub in the ground, you know, uh, of that's maybe, I don't know, 30 gallons. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. You wow. don't need that much. Great. Yeah, because we got some ducks. Our neighbors have some ducks that just kind of uh, uh, harass us in the in the in the uh, in the roads sometimes, and um, they don't have that much water either. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the advice there. So you got the ducks. You got the chickens. Do you have any other birds or any other fowl? No, we have sheep. Oh, beautiful. What kind of sheep? We have Saint Croix sheep. Are those? We run those in our trees, our orchards. Okay. And why do you have the sheep in, uh, in the orchards? Why in that area? Uh, well, the, 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 sheep, the cows are too big to eat the grass in the orchards, and they'll, too, they'll be hit trees, and they're too, not, they're too like, you know, bull in a china shop. Yeah. They're just too big. So sheep are gentler on the trees. They're lower to the ground, um, and so they, they, work, they, they work nicely in the trees. Because we've got a lot so of sit too we're getting two crops, so we run, we see the grass in between our trees as as pasture. So, like in our almonds, we're getting almonds and we're getting lamb. Two crops. Tr the animals are fertile. The sheep are fertilizing the trees. They're eating. They're eating the grass, which we'd be cutting the grass if they weren't eating the grass. And um, we're getting two crops. And you're not. These are not for milk. These are. Do you do you use them for wool? Not for or for wool because they're hair sheep. They okay. they don't produce wool. Do they have they're the hot weather sheep? Do they have the black face? Or? Um, no, you're saying the black face ones are like dorpers. Yeah, but they they're similar to them. Okay. These are pure white. And they have they're a kind of a sh kind of a short hair. Very short hair. Yeah. Nice, nice. And uh, do you use them for meat as well? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I love sheep meat. Uh, do they get very fatty? Do they get a lot of fat? Um. They can. It's very mild tasting meat. Yeah. Do so we notice the uh, the sheep here make a lot more suet than the uh, than the grass fed cattle? Uh, the sheep seem to, as, as far as like just even raw weight, but also per animal, um, they seem to produce a little bit more fat than the uh, than the cattle here because you know it gets really dry here in, in much of the year, so we don't get the fattiest of cow. And of course, they're not getting fattened up with grains, so they don't have that much fat either. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Very interesting. And how how big is the farm out there that you're working with? If you don't mind me asking, twenty one acres. Okay, twenty one acres. And how many how many cattle do you have? Uh, we have right now, I think seven. We yeah. milk milk cows too, so we make cheese, yogurt, butter. Great, great. And um, are you having to water the pasture yourself, or how, how do you manage? Okay. Our pastures are all irrigated. Great, great, and. Um, yeah, so you get a pretty dry. I mean, you have some major droughts there in Northern California the last few years, right? Oh, well, the, you even in a wet year, it still doesn't rain from May to October. So Man. there's always six months dry. I mean, it's a Mediterranean climate. Yeah, but we we have abundant water resources, so okay, we're good. And what about the grasses? Like, what uh, do you have different types of grasses that you've experimented with over the years? Well, we. Remember, in nature, nature hates the monoculture. You always yeah. want to, uh, you always, the more variety, the more resilience, the more diversity, the more resilience. So when I, we plant a pasture, uh, we'll plant, you know, 20 varieties of grasses. Nice. Yeah, we got to diversify. So We've really got to diversify because uh, there's a pretty invasive grass here. They call it yaragua. I'm not sure what you call it in English, but it's, uh, it's not the best protein source. It's very, it doesn't get very tall. It grows pretty rapidly, which is why some people like it. But it also dries up, and it's like a tinderbox in the dry season. So we're, we're definitely looking at bringing in a bunch of different types of grasses. Where we're trying to kind of just keeping our eyes out to uh, for which ones we want to use. Um, but do you do you have some some very tall grasses and short grasses and just a, a wide variety or? Yeah, yeah, and not all grasses. Clovers, you know, 
legumes, uh, and then we always plant some medicinals in in with it in the pastures too, like plantain and nice. stuff like that, dewormers, stuff like that. Oh uh, yeah, now that's a that's a really interesting concept. So what what type of dewormers and how do you how do you use those? Because I know a lot of people will, you know, they'll deworm animals with strong chemicals, or you know, they'll. Uh, yeah. You know, va- vaccinate with uh, very very intense uh, drugs. So how 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 do you guys work with that type of stuff? How do you? Uh... So first of all, if you move your cows or ruminants often, you're not going to get the same parasite loads because they're moving off and they're not eating on their own poop. Most people keep have the corral fixed, and so they're reinoculating themselves with parasites all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So and, and in nature, if they're moving all the time too, you get you get less uh, of that parasite load. So that's number one, you know, keep them, keep them moving. Number two is, you know, the plant, we just plant a bunch of stuff. I just get this mix called, uh, it's from Peaceful Valley. It's some kind of herbal mix. It has all kinds of beneficial things, herbs, herbs, and uh, forbs yeah. for, for cattle. And I, I actually don't know exactly what's in it. I know plantain is one of the things that's in it. Yeah. And there's some things in it that are good for, for worming. But when you use those strong antibiotics, the thing that you lose is the, um, what are they called, dung beetles. It'll kill the dung beetles. The, the antibiotics in the gut of the animal when the poop, in the poop will kill the dung beetles. And the dung wow. beetles take the manure nine or ten inches, inches down into the soil. So they're massive carbon uh, fixers. And... Well, in the early days when we were doing more antibiotics with the cattle, we never saw dung beetles. And when we stopped, all of a sudden, dung beetles have started to return big time. So it's important to be very very minimal with uh, the antibiotics for, for lots of reasons. Yeah, right, right, absolutely. That's, that's fascinating. Now, when you say dung beetles, do you mean those, those like big white, whitish blue um grubs that you find no no i don't think so okay. so dung beetles come in lots of shapes and sizes and in ecuador they could be a whole lot different than here mm-hmm. but uh they're 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 usually you know maybe the size of your baby fingernail okay and uh the ones we have here are mostly like brownish but they and they're actually kind of hard to see. You kind of got to pick apart the the patty to, to really see them. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, they're they're a fascinating soil building part of the system. So they come out and they fly around, right? Because here we do it. We have a lot of these little brown beetles that are about, like you said, the size of your pinky or your thumb. I've never seen them fly. They may fly. You okay. know, I'm not a dung beetle expert, but they 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 take a manure and they take it into the soil, and that's where we want it. Yeah, nice, nice. So, oh, and what type of what what type of plants and what type of crops are you growing out there? What are you uh, What are you actually growing? You're not just doing corn and soy, are you? No, I mean we're we're way too diverse. It makes us very inefficient mm-hmm. because we we want to do everything. We want to basically our our kind of game we're playing is we want to eat eighty percent of our calories from our property. Yeah. So you know, so we do all the dairy products. We do beef and we do lamb. We do um, for all and almost all the nuts. We do almonds, pecans, walnuts. We do peaches, plums, uh, chestnuts, uh, jujubes, um, pears, some apples. Yes. Uh, we do persimmons. A lot of persimmons. Uh, we do blackberries. Uh, and then we do all the veg, you know, pretty much all the vegetables, you know, from sweet corn to watermelon, asparagus to, to watermelon. Oh, man, wow! And this is all on on twenty one acres. You're able to have yeah. seven head of cattle. How many sheep do you say you had again? Oh, let's say twenty five. Wow, quite a bit. And uh, how many chickens you got roaming out there? Maybe a hundred. Yeah. Wow, man. Is that I mean? You say 40 eight, ducks. when you say eighty percent, forty ducks. Okay, how many eggs a day are you getting from these chickens on average, like in in, a, in the good season, right? And I know it's a seasonal production. Four or five, do- uh, yeah, five, five dozen. Wow. On a good, 
Well, when you say when you say eighty percent of our calories that we eat from our land, I mean four or five dozen eggs that could feed a family <laughs> for a whole week. Oh, but we're, we're you know we're selling eggs to um, yeah. We have a there's a paleo cafe that takes all our eggs. Nice. Eggs, you know. Yeah. Nice. Oh man, yeah, I'm I'm impressed with how much you're able to do with you know what some people might not consider a massive plot of land, right? I mean, it sounds like you have a a, a very modest property that you've uh, done a really good job at producing quite a bit of food from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, an acre of vegetables produces a lot of food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, as far as um, calories per, you know, the amount of food that you're able to produce on the land you're obviously you're using both animals and plants but it seems like a lot of like calorically it seems like you're yielding so much food from animals when it's cheese dairy milk eggs you know in abundance um am i right in assuming that you're yielding more food from the animals than you are from the pure vegetable agriculture no weight wise no i mean no weight wise i mean no, because, you know, like, for instance, today, 200 to pounds of tomatoes went into the restaurant. Uh, you know, no. Poundage is way more. Zucchini, cucumbers, uh, you know, or, you know, yeah. got pounds and pounds of peaches. No, definitely more uh, pound-wise. Because, remember, animal foods are concentrated, very concentrated. That, that's what I'm considering uh, calorically. Like, oh, I'm, pound, I'm, yeah. I, no, I've never bothered to to count. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, never bothered to count. But yeah. it's it's a rich, it's very rich on both fronts. Yeah, no, you you mentioned a cafe gratitude was all about abundance, and it seems like uh, you know your farm out there uh, is Be Love Farm is is really producing a uh, quite an abundance of different types of foods. It's amazing. I mean, you've got you know high quality fruits, vegetables, lots of animal foods. And, um, and I wanted to ask you about the dairy. You know, how, how uh, you mentioned you're doing cheeses. Uh, do you also do raw milk or cream or anything like that? Or how does that work? We don't sell it to the public, but for ourselves, we do. Yeah. Nice. Raw, raw milk, butter, ghee. Ah. Love that ghee. And olive oil. I forgot to tell you, olive oil. We make Whoa. 200 gallons of olive oil a year. That's impressive. And you press it yourself? Yeah. No, there's a press about 12 miles from the farm. Yeah, I remember in Santa Rosa, we went to the farmers market, and they were they had people would bring olives and they'd press it right there at the uh, at the uh, farmers market. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, what kind of cheeses are you making? Well, my wife's the cheese maker, and she makes brie, she makes parmesan, she makes um, uh, the Oaxacan style cheese. She makes something we call farm said, which is kind of our signature cheese, which is like a hard a medium hard Italian cheese. Um, she makes, uh, what's that stuff called? Uh, anyway, lots of cheeses, lots yeah. of different cheeses. Yeah. And is she so stay, we, pr we, she stay pretty busy we, making we, cheese. Cause I know it's a lot of work. It's not easy to make cheese. I mean, even just butter, right? Butter is pretty labor intensive. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's that milk has to be dealt with every day and made into something. She probably makes cheese a couple times a week. Nice. Man. How much milk are you guys getting a day? It depends how many cows we're milking. Right now we're milking one cow, so we're getting three gallons a day because we only do one. We only do once a day milking. Mm -hmm. But if we're doing two cows, then we're getting twice that. For three cows, sometimes we're milking three cows. What breed are you running over there? We have Jerseys and Jersey Normandy mixes. Normandy. Okay, I'm not too familiar with Normandy. They're from northern France. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of cream They're production? Or? High butter. Yeah, high butter fat. Nice. Yeah, that's, yeah, I love, I think butter is just, butter makes every single food so much better. I'd say butter is probably my, one of my favorite foods. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, we got a couple of brown Swiss cows. Well, she's pregnant right now. Our heifer's pregnant. And then we've got a, uh, a, a smaller one that's about four months old. And that she's a brown Swiss, a brown Swiss, mi Swiss mixed with uh, gear. And we're hoping that we get some decent butter fat production from that because we uh, we go through a lot of butter. Our kids love it. Yeah, yeah. Who doesn't? That's right. Awesome. Right. 
Yeah, that's amazing, man. It's a, it sounds like you guys have done such a good job at managing it. I mean, what kind of projects are you are you looking forward towards right now? And uh, you know, what do you what would you like to improve uh, with what you're doing out there on the farm at B Love? Well, we just kind of switched over to our no till vegetable system, so I like, I like to you know that's it's very promising so far. But I'd like to really see that developed where you know after five six years it's inches of deep black soil because we're just you know always building on it but never tilling to oxidize the carbon so developing that more and uh, we want to start growing wheat because we we love making bread my wife's also mastered sourdough bread yeah we nice. have a wood we have a wood fired oven uh so yeah the wheat thing is kind of the, the missing link of the food that we don't have yeah. wheat is kind of it so all right, let's try it. Yeah, it yeah. I'm, I'm actually I'm a, kind of a fan of sourdough bread myself. I mean, a lot of people. I mean, I'm pretty critical of most grains in general, just as far as you know the the way that they're processed, the way that they're grown. Uh, but sourdough is definitely a way of making it much more bioavailable and more digestible, right? I mean, I love it. I mean, I've never had trouble digesting wheat, but um, it certainly seems to be better for most a lot of guts. Yeah, yeah, it's a, another natural fermentation process, just like you mentioned how the cows manure, you're sequestering carbon in the soil. I mean, uh, we've got a fermentation process right there that's making that food more bioavailable, definitely changing the vitamin and mineral content and the, uh, the bioavailability of it. So I think uh, sourdough, for people who can't give up the bread, uh, or if you're kids, you know, if you're doing more, a lot of people that watch the channel probably do a low-carbohydrate diet and aren't using any bread or wheat, but, you know, if you've got kids... Um, and they want that bread. I think sourdough bread is a much better option for you. You might want to look into it to the uh, to the viewers out there. Um, nice. So the uh, the no till. You're looking at really pushing that forward. Uh, do you think you could handle more animals? Uh, and you mentioned seven head of cattle, loads of sheep. No, I mean no. I think we're a good a good stasis. About right. We we got it about right. Yeah. What's a, a kind of last line of questioning, and then I'll, I'll let you go. I know it's getting late in the afternoon over there, and you probably worked really hard. Um, what does your daily life look like? I mean, like today, for instance, from the time you wake up until now when you're talking to me on um, here on uh, we're using Google Hangouts and talking from halfway around the world, but what does your daily tasks look like? You mentioned your wife's making cheese, but what do things look like for, uh, for Matthew Engelhardt over there at, at the farm? Well, we get up and we have coffee together and then uh, we go milk a cow or cows depending and then somebody makes breakfast and the crew there's how many people there's about five people living here on the property so it's a, a community effort and yeah I uh, mostly I'm like gathering materials so people can do their work either getting diesel or you know uh, getting something fixed I do a lot of maintenance yeah uh, parts for this parts for that um changing water filters uh water maintenance on water systems um yeah there's a, a zillion tasks with I mean, we grow so many different crops check the peach crop um yeah all kinds of things yes I, I sorted tomatoes this morning so that a couple hundred pounds could go into the restaurant uh, sent someone in to deliver them. Uh, yeah, I'll make some. I'm gonna make tomato sauce later on because we got all these imperfect tomatoes that need to be put up in the can for tomato sauce uh, for the winter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there you go. It's super diverse. In in the winter time, I prune because we have thousands of trees, right? So I yeah. prune and prune and uh, that, that's that's a huge chore. Uh, yeah, make sure we get our seeds ordered. Tomorrow I'll go pick up at some starts from a greenhouse so we can get start our brass fall brass because get our fall brassicas planted. Um, yeah, it's nonstop, nonstop. We got to make we make wine too. I forgot to tell you, we make a thousand <laughs> bottles of wine. We do natural naturally fermented, no sulfites, no yeast. 100% naturally fermented wine that's delicious. We sell, very easy to sell. Yeah. Um, and uh, 
so yeah, I got to make sure we have bottles, everything, all that. You grow the grapes? We grow the grapes. Barbera grapes. They've been grown since Roman times. Wow. You just, you have so much going on. I mean, you got everything. I mean, 21 acres, you got wine, olive oil, uh, every, you sheep, cows, chickens. No goats, right? You ever thought about bringing goats in? No, goats. They get in the trees. They destroy trees in five seconds. Yeah, they're a pain in the butt. Them. They're really hard to keep confined, too. They love to escape. Yeah. But then remember that there's also the whole, all the personalities, all the, all the people. Yeah. I mean, the, the hardest part about farming, I want your viewers to get is the hardest thing about life is the people part of it. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, it must not be hard for you to sell the products that you're making, though, right? It seems like the market for, you know, really uh, good farm-to-table food is, uh, is growing. Do you think that this uh, – how do you feel about kind of the future of agriculture? I mean, you mentioned – the way that we're doing things now, for the most part, the way that most industrial agriculture is going, it is, it, you know, it's kind of an abomination, right? And it's very, very destructive to the, uh, it's very environmentally destructive. It's always monocropping, you know, very, uh, well, a lot of the times patented GMO seeds is what most people are focused on because they supposedly will yield the highest, even though that doesn't seem to work out so well uh, long term. Um, how do you feel about the future of agriculture and where things are going? Well, there is some encouraging things happening. Um, my my son's nonprofit called Kiss the Ground is just got a six hundred thousand dollar grant from General Mills, so that they can train fifty suppliers in their supply chain, fifty growers in their supply chain in regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. So there are there there are people. There's a, a farmer named Gabe Brown in North Dakota who's managing five thousand acres regeneratively, no-till, uh, and he's really got it down, and he's making way more money than his neighbors, and he's figured it out, and he started something called the Soil uh, Soil Health Academy, and with two other guys, and they're, they're Kiss the Ground's taking this money and sending farmers to their academy, wow. um, so that, so, I mean, change is too slow, it's super concerning, and there are glimmers of hope. The Dole Foods, which is one of the biggest food make producers in the world, has hired someone we know to uh, take them biological in the next 10, 15 years. There are, there's glimmers of hope. And, uh, you know, again, changing people's minds is uh, difficult, challenging. Yeah. Yeah, especially when there's a lot of money involved, right? I mean, we can blind ourselves with greed. Yeah, but I hope you know. Hopefully, people are waking up that you know we're denuding the planet, and uh, if we care at all about our grandchildren, we'll uh, take some different actions. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something that I think a lot of the viewers here are looking uh, are looking deeper into. People are more concerned with where they get their food from. They want to connect directly with farmers like you. They want to connect directly with ranchers. You know, they want grass fed beef. They want uh, organic free range eggs. You know, they they want these high quality animal foods. They want raw milk. I mean, a lot of the, there's a lot more demand for these things. And uh, you know, so I'm glad that you're out there doing what you're doing. It sounds sounds like maybe your son would be uh, a, a great person for me to possibly interview uh, down the line. Yeah, and yeah, you should definitely interview him. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to uh, maybe have you uh, if you could uh, maybe help me make contact with him. That'd be great because we are, you know, we're trying to do out here just on our own little homestead. I mean, we're obviously we're very small scale, but we're we're moving the same direction, right? We want to be able to produce, um, you know, all the food that we eat. We want to be able to be self-sustained off of our own land, and you know, be providing other families with food as well in a regenerative way, and of course, you know, ultimately spread that so more people can learn how to do it. Um, you know, because uh, you know, in Latin America, uh, I mean, yeah, it's it, the the food production globally is a mess, right? I mean, there are a lot of local producers everywhere you go who are trying, but maybe the education is lacking. Uh, maybe they a lot of them perceive that you're going to make more money if you plant the GMO seeds, right? You've got the lobbyists from the GMO conglomerates that come through and they say, hey, we're going to, we're going to, we'll hook you up with free seed. Uh, we'll give you a huge discount on your first purchase and all this stuff. And they make it very, uh, very lucrative for people and it can be very deceptive. So what we're trying to do is spread some uh, information on regenerative agriculture, like what you're doing. And, um, 
you're right. There, there is a lot of hope. So, uh, if anybody out there is in California, are they able to maybe purchase your products in certain places, or, or is that uh, only they go to our restaurants or uh, if they come to the farm? Yeah, we have a farm store that's open seven days a week. Nice farm store, and that's in you mentioned was it Petaluma? Vacaville, Vacaville, California. Right on. Vacaville. Between Sacramento, between Sacramento and Sac. Uh, San Francisco and Sacramento. Nice. So if you guys are near Vacaville, uh, definitely check out belovefarm.com. And uh, yeah, Ma- Matthew, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for what you're doing. Really appreciate you coming on. It's uh, you know, It's been an honor talking to you. And I hope that uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing your son's documentary and maybe uh, talking to him and interviewing him. And thank you so much for the leads as well about the uh, the guy Gabe that you mentioned. I'm definitely going to look into his work and, um, and and try to get some of these folks on to, to help spread the word. But uh, where can people find you? You mentioned Be Love Farm, BeLoveFarm.com. Is there anywhere else they might be able to find you uh, on uh, social media? Or do you guys have a website? Or? Yeah, BeLoveFarm.com. All right.